Cool. My name is Kevin Blackstone. How's everybody doing this morning or this afternoon? Great. Um, this will be a working lunch. Uh, and we're here to talk about um, uh, the business of sports um, and uh, the journalism side of it. And right here we have Sashi Brown, who you should know is the president of the Baltimore Ravens. Um, also, interestingly, the second black president of a franchise in the NFL currently, um, the other one being Jason Wright, um, <coughs> right here in, in Washington. Um, let me see, what else can, what, what else? First, we have four now. Five. Four. Five. 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 Who are the other three? Uh, Kevin Warren, who technically really was the first, although he never had That's the right, from the Big Ten. Kevin just came to Chicago. Right. Um, Damani Leach got hired out of the NFL offices. He used to run the NFL international business, and he's at the Denver Broncos. And then Sandra uh, Morgan is uh, out at the Raiders. Wow. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, so all of a sudden, here we are. All of a sudden, you – and now I, I think about that list that you just gave me, so – the Ravens have a history of diverse hiring with Ozzy. Mm -hmm. The Raiders have um, a history of diverse hiring in the front office with coaches um, in terms of um, Flores and, and, uh, and Art Shell, the first uh, black and the first, or the second black coach and the first Hispanic coach. Um, what were the other teams? Um, uh, Denver. Denver. Denver, which just diversified its ownership yes. group. Yes. Um, so what does that say about the NFL then in, in, in hiring? Because we also know that there are a number of teams that have – there are several teams that have hired the bulk of black coaches that have been hired in the league, and then there are still several that have never hired a coach of color, a head coach of color. Yeah, and we certainly can can get into and talk about at least my observations about why that is. But yeah, I, I think you know there's there's room to go on certainly ethnic racial lines, and also a ton of room on the gender side, as as we know. Yeah, but, but some progress being made. Some progress being made, and it, it's interesting because um, I showed um, I have this in my office, which I've never written about. And I don't know if anyone's ever written about it. Maybe somebody did at some point. But this is, um, oh, that's okay, it's just paper. This is uh, a report from 1980 that showed to Sashi, <clears throat> and it was commissioned by a guy named Brig Owens. Brig Owens just died a few years ago. Brig Owens was one of the great football players um, for the Washington franchise. Um, number 23 played, played defensive back. And the name of this study is Institutional Discrimination, a Study of Managerial Recruitment in Professional Football. Um, and it was uh, done through Johns Hopkins. And basically, it is um, uh, an explanation as to, as to the diversity hiring problem in the NFL in 1980. So this is 20 years, a generation before you get the Rooney Rule basically. Um, and we still have this, this, this situation. But at any rate. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, um, <clears throat> I think people think about race relations as something very, very historical. But as I sit here now, I think it's still a, a noteworthy fact that I'm the first generation in my family that grew up outside slavery or segregation. The first. So uh, that's not to say that the lack of progress is right, but it's also important to put in context where we stand, how close we are to that history in many ways. Our current times, we're seeing a lot that's going on with DeSantis in Florida, depending on where your politics lie, but certainly are reflective of uh, times that my parents were trying to escape, you know, in terms of coming to the east from the south. So we've made a lot of progress. There's a lot more to go, uh, but uh, these democracies are hard experiments. They are. Can you tell the students a little bit about your uh, progression to become president of the Ravens, where you're from, and, and where you, how, how you got to where you're at? Yeah, painfully sometimes. Um, but, but I, 
sat in a class like you all as a journalism student in 1994 through 1998 on Hampton University's campus in southeastern Virginia. I'd grown up in Boston, uh, but really craved a more diverse academic culture. Hampton had a great student-led radio station, uh, and I was interested in broadcast journalism, thought I wanted to be a sports center anchor. Who doesn't? Yeah, junior year, junior year of, of my undergrad years, I interned at ESPN, and we were laughing outside. I got an offer after working the monotony of cutting highlights every day for three months uh, for $7.50 an hour, no benefits. <laughs> so uh, I was, I think I was wise enough then to get back into school. Um, a year later. Actually, I applied and got into the NBA's National Basketball Association management rotational program, so I was really excited. And the night before I got on the Amtrak to go down to New York from my parents' home in Boston, uh, Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewan uh, took the players out on strike. So circled up, taught school for a little bit, and started taking classes to get into law school and Business school, matriculated at uh, Harvard Law, 99 to 2002, shifted my focus into more of the business side, so I wasn't a litigator like you'd see on Law and Order or something on TV. I did uh, much more business transactions work, so finance, mergers and acquisitions of company, private equity, those types of uh, those types of transactions, kind of took me away from a uh, great liberal arts background, but much more into a business management. Uh, and strategy role. And then part of my practice when I got out of school, I went to a law firm in DC, and there was a partner there uh, named Dick Cass. Dick uh, was one of these old school lawyers who wasn't specialized in anything, could kind of do everything. And one of the things that Dick did was uh, he sued the NFL uh, for commercial rights on behalf of Jerry Jones, who was a young owner of the Dallas Cowboys. He did that successfully enough that not only did Jones recommend him to his partners and others, but the league actually thought Dick Hannon was so well, he became kind of the go-to guy for the league, so he stood up a sports practice. So going back to my passion for sports, um, I went to work with Dick and did work with Dick. Fast forward three years, uh, and I haven't talked about this publicly, but one of the last pieces of, of uh, law that I practiced at the firm was actually Steve Bashotti's purchase of the Ravens. Mm. Um, then I went in-house to the Jags, spent about seven or eight years there, mostly on the business side, but ultimately on the business and football side. Recruited to join the Cleveland Browns, worked on the business side and football side, and ultimately just the football side. Fired by the Cleveland Browns, uh, moved to Miami for a year with my kids and hung out on the beach uh, and did some consulting and then started working for Monumental Sports and Entertainment uh, downtown DC who owned the Capitals, the Mystics, the Wizards, amongst some other sports properties, a couple esports teams you guys are probably familiar with. Um, and then Dick was retiring and called me and said, hey, I've watched your career and uh, we're looking to bring some fresh ideas and perspective in. We think your background on both the football and business side could be helpful leading. And I had a tremendous amount of connections from what was at that point 12, 13 years in the NFL already. So it was kind of a little bit of a homecoming um, in terms of coming back to the NFL, but that's, that's how it happened. Wow. Well, that's a that's a heck of a, a heck of a journey, and if I'm not mistaken, when you got dismissed, we'll say dismissed. Uh, fire, it's okay. Fire, it's okay. <laughs> we can be accountable. From, here. from the yeah, from the Browns, you were very. My recollection is you were very um, honest about it. You were not. You didn't. At least, what I remember, what I saw, you didn't express any bitterness. Um, uh, the team was like 0 and 16. I'm just saying that you didn't well, coach me. I only own eight. They fired me with those last eight, so don't put those on oh, Okay, right. I won't put those on you. Uh, but you owned up to it. You said you understood it. You appreciated the opportunity. What, what, what was your uh, relationship with the media around that time? And um, did any of your uh, early desire to be a journalist play into how you 
connected with the media? Uh, perhaps a bit, but uh, I, I've been the benefit, and I would encourage you all just to find great mentors around. You'd be surprised at how helpful people can be. So Ernie Acorsi, Tony Dungy, Shaq Harris, Ozzy uh, were all people that I called before I took that job, established relationships throughout my career. So when I came out of Cleveland, I was seething because we had – gone to the owner, ownership really came to me and said, hey, would you run the football side? You're kind of the one person we had fired a ton of people over a very, very short amount of time. Um, three years, one CEO, one GM, one president, three head coaches, and two GMs. Why I thought I would go in and be different <laughs> is a different story. Um, but um, so when we sat down with them, we had said, listen, our team is built wrong. We really need to rebuild it. It's going to be hard and ugly. But we think we have a plan that we can aggressively do that and come out the other side and be in great shape. But it requires your commitment to do that. And if you really don't want to commit to it, um, let's not do it. Let's go hire somebody else. It's going to take three to four years at least. Um, but we felt like in year four we would be on the position to be good for a decade. So, you know, 14 months later when they came to me and said, you're out, uh, obviously, I wasn't very happy, but I talked to Tony Dungy, who had watched John Gruden take his defense and win a Super Bowl and get all the credit um, at one point in his year. That's not how he would put it. That's my interpretation. That's uh, fair. But uh, and I talked to him, you know, as I saw some things coming down the pike, and he said, "Sash, you know, stick with your character. People will trust that, um, and opportunities will come back later." And I don't think without Tony being there, I would have had that. Um, that resolve and in fact he said you know get with someone put out a statement and a great mentor of mine Ron Shapiro here in Baltimore who you probably know was Brooks Robinson and uh, Kyle Ripken's agent great early agent you know helped me think through the moment so you know leaned on folks my wife as well who's a Terp uh, leaned on folks in those moments when you hit that adversity um, but you also you know tap back into your character so I think it was probably less than than journalism as much as it was just the kind of the character you're raised with and having confidence in yourself that you're not defined by your career, your grades, your, where you go to school, really defined by your actions, um, less by your words. Interesting. So what, what is it like to work in the biggest sports corporation on the planet Earth, a $20 billion monster corporation that runs our lives now on Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Saturday, when the season's not even going on, like right now, you're in the midst of a, and I know you'll answer this because a number of people want to know what you're going to do with Lamar Jackson. Um, and I can give him a call if you want, and maybe you he got can. got written on a piece of paper I'm going to hand thank, you. Thank you, you thank you very much. Right in. Thank, yeah. You can just keep this between <laughs> us. Um, so what's it like working for, for this bohemian? Um, you know, so so a couple interesting things. One, I think Google's running all our lives, but um, I would say it's surprisingly intimate. So we have an enormous public profile at the teams. The league is big. It has an enormous profile. We are a small company. We have 250 employees. Take the couch, coaches and scouts out. We probably have 125, 150. Um, so that feels like a small company. I know everybody in our building by name, see them. Uh, so there's a family orientation to that. Um, we have all tried to accelerate our processes and business practices because over the last 15 years, as the valuation of companies go up, the public, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say pressure, but the public focus on us um, it requires a, a different level of sophistication. But it does feel very intimate. I know every owner in the league by name, every president in the league by name, a ton of coaches. Todd Monk and I worked together when I was in Jacksonville. We just hired him as offensive coordinator. It does feel like a family. Going back to what you talked about earlier, that's one of the challenges, right? Because there's a ton of nepotism, there's a, a very tight network, and so we're recycling out of the same people. So if you're a woman that's been outside that network, it's hard to break in. If you're Hispanic that's been outside that network, it's hard to break in because people are so tribal within, within that small family. Um, but having said that, it's, it's, you know, you wake up every day, and what I love, my father was a musician, jazz musician, grew up in the Civil Rights era, um, and, 
he, he would always talk about how music is the one thing that can bring the world together. And that was more or less his life's work. Um, I think sports is also the other piece. You know, there's nothing that brings the city of Baltimore together or a community together that, like the NFL, in our case, or soccer in some places, um, but even smaller factions in terms of baseball and basketball and, and what have you. And it transcends all of the tribes, right, um, and all the divisions that we create for ourselves in society. And so I think it's a really powerful platform. It's very fun to have that, and, and I'm proud to be associated with something that can cut across all those divisions and bring people together and be a unifier, and, and then utilize that platform to hopefully improve you know our community as well so we have the opportunity to do that but it's fun you know you go in and marlon humphrey's goofing off with ronnie stanley and lamar's over there doing something amazing and so you know it's a really special privilege to have to be able to work alongside these really superhuman guys i get that question all the time like aren't they pain in the butt don't you have to chase after them? You're a lawyer. Do you spend all these? Like, none of that. All these guys are really self-disciplined, incredibly high intelligence uh, and processing power you have to have up here to be able to play this game at the speed they play it at. Um, and so I've, I've enjoyed it. I've spent time in the NBA and NFL and found the same in the NBA. So it's a real privilege. So you work for a, a small, intimate company within this $20 billion Industry and the small company is probably valued at what five, six billion dollars if it were to go on the market right now, which means you could probably pay, let's say, a top notch quarterback $45 million guaranteed. Is that well? We'll get, we'll get back to that. We'll get Do back we to that. Do we have a hard cap or uh, <laughs> just off here? This isn't baseball. <laughs> <laughs> what, are the, uh, what are the biggest business challenges in the NFL um, right now? Yeah, I, th I think for us it's media. So, absolutely, the NFL, any given year, take the top 50 programs on television, 47, 48 of them are NFL games. So you go all the way from the Super Bowl down to like a week 13 matchup between the Cowboys and the Ravens. One o'clock game, four o'clock game, something like that is going to be, it, it is by far the most dominant content that is produced domestically by far. Um, and so our league under Pete Rozelle brought television rights together back in, the, I don't know what year it was, 60s, 70s. Yes. Um, that was the catalyst for the growth and the valuations that you're talking about. So in any given year in our league, our national, our television rights are bundled nationally. So Green Bay gets the same check from Fox that New England does or Chicago does or Dallas. Really important to keep in mind. The NBA has a split and baseball is almost all local. So the Milwaukee Brewers feel a lot different than the New York Yankees because the Yankees television market is enormous. The Dodgers television market is enormous and it creates this anti-competitiveness or this imbalance in terms of equity to be able to have resources that come from the revenues to be able to keep up with an open salary cap. Um, and that's why they can pay Aaron Judge a quarter billion dollars. There's a lot of teams in the league that just don't have access to that level of player and can, could compensate them. In our league, we're able to do that. And the strength has been uh, and, and the media negotiations, which, by the way, is where all the money is in sports. You think the players make a lot. Uh, you saw Tony Romo's contract. Tony's working for three or four executives that are probably work making uh, close to as much as he is. But the money is really there, and it's been an advertising model, right? We put the content on. A lot of people watch it. Advertisers pay a lot. You've all seen the Super Bowl ads. Um, so that's worked really well for us as a league. And what's happened over the last 10 years is Netflix showed up and Disney Plus showed up and people started cutting cable because cable was stubborn enough, like Blockbuster, that they thought they would still be able to get all of you to pay $175 and still not get a showtime. And so uh, they're losing that battle quickly, more quickly than we all anticipated. So what we used to be able to go to Fox and NBC and, and ABC and CBS and say, hey, everybody's there. It's a one-stop shop. Let's cut a deal. 
Now what we're finding is when we go back to them, they're under a lot of pressure. So our media revenues on a traditional linear format, which are those, those companies, uh, the network companies in ESPN, um, they all, you know, used to, those rights used to go like this. And what's happened is when you go back to them, they say, listen, our subscribership is down. So we can't pay you the same amount of money. That's happened a ton at the regional sports networks. Everybody know what those are? Why? So, so these are cable, uh, locally or regionally produced networks that produce sports. Um, their subscribership has gone way down because basically the cable providers have gone back to them and said, hey, I, I know I was paying you 15 cents a subscriber. I can only pay you four. So the Yankees own their network, but if you're someone like the Orioles, they actually own their network too, but if you're the Nationals, let's keep playing round robin here, but the Nationals, for instance, who just cut a deal with um, the RSN, when they go back, their rights are being cut in half or worse. So there's a huge pressure on sports right now to figure this out. You guys may have Amazon Prime, probably most of you do. How many people have Amazon Prime? Okay, so that's what it used to look like. Look around the room. That's what it looked like, used to look like when I would say, who has cable? Who has cable? <laughs> right. So you see what happened? So it flipped on its head. And now we decided at the NFL, let's go to Amazon Prime because we want the hands. Right? And so you all probably don't think of Amazon Prime as I'm going to watch NFL football. But once they started their streaming app, we understood the concentration and the penetration into the markets was now with the technology companies. It's no longer with the linear format for a lot of different reasons. So that disruption has been huge for us. We've buoyed and held firm and continue to get increases with the linear format, but we can see that that's falling off a cliff. So it's, there's a huge amount of testing and technology and discussion and negotiation going on as to how to preserve, how, to, how do we get to where our customers are? So our big challenge right now is how do we find you? How do we get our content to you since you're no longer watching the 6 o'clock news on NBC? So when you were at Monumental owned by Ted Leonsis, um, Ted came out a few times and kind of made it clear that he really wanted to take over the media for all the teams that he he owns. Um, has that strategy now changed in just the last couple of years? Well, he bought the RSN. Right. Um, and there's a really good case study on this. So the Phoenix Suns, um, you know, really were under it. They were in the last year of their deal with their RSN, they extended one year at a negotiated number and they brought Chris Paul in and they made it to the NBA Finals. Had they not had a good team, they would have been kind of the first mm. baseball or NFL team that probably would have seen their local uh, deal be at a level that it would have put their finance, their entire finances in jeopardy. Wow. So Sinclair is a company that's right here in Maryland. If you guys don't know them, you should study them. Really interesting. Private equity guys go out and buy from Fox when Fox sold under Murdoch, bought up all of their uh, regional sports networks at probably the worst time ever. Loaded it up with a ton of debt, and now it looks like it's going to crater it and put it into bankruptcy. So they have dozens of regional sports networks and they've gone back to the NHL and Major League Baseball and NBA and said unless you guys do a deal with us at a fraction of the price we're going to go into bankruptcy and who knows what happens to your rights in that scenario so a lot of work is being put across all the leagues to figure out what we can do and you know, not only are we talking to Amazon Prime, but you look at the success of a Netflix or a Disney Plus, I'm sure these leagues, as you've seen them all, put a lot more of their content on their own apps. So there's an NBA app, there's an NFL app. That's really what's coming. And I, I don't think the leagues are ready to make that leap yet to say we'll go direct to consumer, which is what these products are. But that's certainly part of the strategy as we move forward and, and figuring out how to uh, preserve our content. So that sounds like there's a lot of journalism there um, to be needed. 
right, to cover all this and break it down for the public and make it very understandable to, to, the, to the public. Um, and I should point out, and I know Connie wanted me to point this out to, to you folks, that um, before I was a sports columnist, sports journalist, I covered economics, I covered finance. Um, and what got me in the sports, uh, the sports side of the newspaper was the, the, the sports editor came to me and asked if I would cover some aspects of the business of sports. And that's what got me to this particular, particular side. So from your standpoint, um, how would you judge the, uh, the coverage of the business of, of sports? How many people are coming to a really good understanding of everything you just laid out given the reporting that's done about it? Um, I, think it's, I think it's out there. I think it's out there pretty well. It's drowned out by some of your colleagues. Um, and the biggest rise we who? got was, <laughs> yeah, the biggest rise we got, you know who. Um, the biggest rise we got was about Lamar, right? So the business is, it, it's worth reading about, but it's not overly exciting. Um, and what people want in terms of sports is really, uh, what about this play? What about this player? What about this matchup coming up? And so we really try to focus on that. Uh, we also like to have a little privacy around, um, you know, what, what we're valued at. We're public companies. We get public subsidies. We just did a deal with the governor, and there were a bunch of comments about there about why are we subsidizing billionaires. We could get into that too. Um, but the Sun, um, you know, started writing articles about you know what a bad deal this was uh, for the state of Maryland um, and we could get into that debate all day but suffice it to say this is kind of like the cat and dog that's gone back and forth since these big sports teams and frankly non-sports um, companies are attracted through state funds um, and tax subsidies I mean Amazon sure as hell didn't need a subsidy but Arlington is going to benefit, Virginia is going to benefit a ton by getting HQ2, and there were 12 other cities lined up, right, to, to try to get them there. So um, I, I think we probably, the industry does a decent job at it, um, but your industry is under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, the model has shifted under your feet quicker than it's shifted on ours. We're kind of a reverb from what's happened in your industry, right? People reading less, moved to digitization, the big conglomerates in terms of newspapers were extremely slow to adapt. They got caught with their pants down, and now that industry is kind of, you know, disjointed. And, you know, that's a really, really, as we just learned over the last presidency, an incredibly important uh, role in our society and our democracy. So, uh, you know, study uh, as much as you can because I think this, this, uh, traditionally I think journalism has been effectively the fourth arm of our gov government and, um, and I think it's going to play an incredibly important role moving forward in a much more challenging terrain to try to figure out how we do it. Um, but I think generally to answer your question simply, I think uh, too much is reported on sports, in my opinion, um, but but you all do enough. You all do enough um, <laughs> on our business, for sure. Too much. All right. So if it's too much, that sounds like you're doing a good job, right? And that there are some opportunities out there for, for well, all the, of you to the, cover this. The talking heads, we could cut a, we could cut out of. <laughs> I don't know if we need. I don't know if we need that. You did all the all as the talking. As much as I like Stephen A. Stephen A. <laughs> well, I've known Stephen A. for a long time. I've known him since he was covering high schools in Philadelphia and then covering uh, Temple University. I remember he called me up one night crying because John Cheney wouldn't talk to him about some situation <laughs> going to team. He wanted me to broker a deal. I was like, I was like. I'm like, Stephen, I have nothing I can do. It's the guy you cover. I don't cover him on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, but that kind of stuff makes makes news. People and watch. Yeah, people yeah, watch. People no, he's, not, he's not up there speaking to no one. No. And, and you're right. I mean, again, it's, it's, it, the sports are the, the grand unifier. People will, I've got a buddy, and he listens to him every day, and I'm, I, I'm shocked. <laughs> but um, he does. He does. Yeah. Um, it, it, but just to the, 
to the Lamar situation. I'm just bringing this up because, not because you're close to it or because. Persistence is a key <laughs> of being a great journalist. So here we go. A master class. <laughs> well, the, the, the football season is over. Yeah. Um, ended in grand style as, as always. Um, but the big stories right now for the NFL and for most leagues in their off season is the business of the sport. And so people want to know, Baltimore, any Baltimore fans in here? Any Ravens fans? There you go, oh, there you go right there. Yeah, I, we didn't invite them. They just show up. It's, they, they admit too them late, to school. Too late, too late. <laughs> and so they want to know, like, how, how the Ravens, not you in particular, of mm -hmm. course, just because you're the president, right. but how Completely the franchise. Completely disassociated. <laughs> I like that. Thank you for that how veil of cover. <laughs> how the franchise is going to handle this situation and it becomes I mean that's it, am I not right is that the driving story right now in Baltimore for Ravens fans how this situation will resolve itself yeah I think across the NFL you really never know you know and these situations come up you know annually we, we are no doubt the number one story in the league right now and people are watching it um, and it is the daytime drama. I mean, it, it gives people something to talk about, and people do care about the NFL. And, and as much as I jest, um, we're really privileged to have people care about virtually everything we do. We can't produce enough content um, that, that would satisfy you know, the fans craving for it. Um, with respect to Lamar, like, here's what we know. Um, he, he himself has said he's turned down a massive deal. Um, we know the union has said that they are focused, rifle focused on his deal and trying to get quarterbacks to fully guaranteed deals. Um, so the circumstance really in some ways is, is beyond the Ravens. This is a system kind of battle that's going on. Um, and I think it's important like people need to understand how the systems work. This isn't baseball. So in the NFL, we have a closed amount of dollars. So all that happens if you decide, um, what's your name? Josh. Josh. We're going to pay Josh. Uh, let's just say everybody pays tuition in here. And we're going to say Josh gets to pay $10 of tuition. You guys all pay 100 right? It's the opposite of Lamar, but you guys get it, right? So he's treated differently than everybody else. You can't treat everybody in here. Everybody can't pay $10 because school doesn't work, right? So in a closed system, guaranteed contracts result in, in every sport, guaranteed contracts result in some player, Kevin Love, Ben Simmons, Kyrie Irvin. Um, they result in dollars lost, sometimes for injury, sometimes for knuckleheadedness, sometimes for, 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 for performance. In a closed system, that operates on steroids because those dollars just go away. The Yankees write off Alex Rodriguez, and then they'll go sign Mark Teixeira. Um, we can't do that because once the dollar's gone, it's gone. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see what happens. I do not think for the union rank and file, this is even if they get to a, a fully guaranteed deal like Deshaun and Kirk Cousins and have, have, have gotten over the last couple of years, I don't think it's going to be a good thing for the rank and file, but it's a kind of feather. It's a huge, it's the cap and the feather for a union to be able to say that they've accomplished that. This is, you know, my kind of private belief, but I think, um, you know, I understand the notion of these guaranteed contracts because I think colloquially people will think, oh, risking injury, go out there, get injured, so on and so forth. But I can promise you for every one of those players that goes out there and gets saved, there's going to be a young player that doesn't get an opportunity or doesn't get to a contract because the system's going to have a lot more waste in it. And we have not 13, 14, 15 guys like the NBA does or a 30-man roster with unlimited cap like the MLB does, we have 90 guys in the spring that get cut down to about 75, and we only have so many dollars. So the more that go to single players, um, the less you know are, are available for others. And so I think it's going to put a lot of pressure on the system. Maybe there's a second play, but in the short term, I think it's a bad thing. If I'm a non 
premier elite player in the NFL, my life got just got a lot harder if you start to guarantee the top 5% of players' contracts. Well, with that, let me open it up to uh, the floor for questions. Please um, uh, give your name, um, your uh, year, and uh, where you're from. Start here, and we'll go right over there. Hi, uh, my name is Jack. I'm from just outside of Philadelphia. I'm a sophomore here. And I was wondering, going back to the contract talks, is it something that the union is trying to do, that they're trying to push someone like a Daniel Jones who's a free agent this year? It, are they trying to get him paid earlier than like a Lamar or a Joe Burrow or a Jalen Hurts? Are they trying to get him paid earlier where his market value to the public eye is maybe less so they can set that market higher for the other guys? Um, you'd have to ask D. Smith. Kevin can bring him up here. Um, I don't know what the union got his number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what the the union's um, strategy is here. Uh, and Lamar's taking his position. Every player has the right to decide where they want to play. Free agency was the big first hurdle for most players' unions, and I think it's it's the right place for them to be, um, at least in kind of our society, the way our, our society works. And I, and I think, you know, you, you, if you allow yourself to personally and emotionally invest too much, because you, you, we're not robots, into these processes, um, it can get really hard to get things done. And so Lamar's got no agent. He's the one player that's held out for this. Uh, that's not a coincidence. The agents know, one, they want to get paid, but two, that had Lamar gone out there and broke his leg like Joe Theismann did last year, he would have taken all that risk on for a bunch of the union members. And to be honest, if you listen to the amount of money that Lamar reported himself, self-reported that he turned down, uh, you would be thinking in that circumstance, how does that make sense for him as an individual? Um, and each player, each agent, has to make their own decision. The union and the agents aren't necessarily aligned all the time. The players in the union aren't necessarily aligned all the time. But there's a lot of alignment and overlap there. So I don't know what their strategy would be with Daniel Jones and the rest of the guys. Uh, you've got some good ideas. You know, you should call them up, get a job down there. <laughs> <laughs> now, you live in Bethesda. D lives in Bethesda, too. I can get you guys together. We can go to uh, Silver Diner or I something. I actually know D. I actually know D. When D got the job, he actually... Um, his going away cocktail party for his his job was at uh, our jazz club in DC. So I've known Bohemian him. Caverns. Yeah, I've known D since 2007 or something like that. 2008. Wow. Yeah. I'm very sorry as a jazz fan that Bohemian Caverns closed. Yeah, um, yeah we are too. Tragedy. We'll go. We'll go, uh, Josh, and then right behind you. Uh, I'm not sure in terms of different than others, and I, I could probably do a better job networking and keeping in touch, but um, I've been the benefit, and it started with my parents, of just instilling in us, you know, respect for people, learn from elders, um, you know, make sure that, it, not intentionally, but you're open to people of different backgrounds, different ideals. And so I think that humility that I would encourage all of you to bring to your question, your your profession, um, and confidence to ask questions and say that you don't know. There's a ton that you're, he doesn't know what he's talking about a lot of times. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about a lot of times. But we will say that we do. No, no, but but to be honest, I think, and I joke, but, but honestly, you know, go out and really be kind of a student in life. Um, that doesn't mean just in academics, that means in your relationships, that means in all the things that you do, is really go out and try to improve yourself reasonably. Uh, and so I've constantly tried to do that. So when I would take a job, I would ask a lot of questions. I would try to, you know, find the people who were doing the things that I wanted to do or doing things the, the way I wanted to do them and improve. And so Tony Dungy was a guy I always looked up to as a, for instance. And I found an opportunity to introduce myself in a rushed moment and get a contact. And without being a bugaboo, before you knew it, I could call Tony. Um, and I've done that throughout the course of my career. And, you know, I've got a lot of people I can call on, some of whom are people that I played football with when I was five years old, you know, guys that know me best in life. So, you know, I think find good people, be a great friend, um, 
and, and you know, lift others up as you all will climb through your careers. Make sure you're bringing others along with you. And I think if you hold to those mantras um, and be intentional about, you know, your craft and what you want to do professionally, you'll find a tremendous resource for you as you grow. You know, I'm a bigger fan of long form, although I don't have long periods of time to consume it. Um, but but I would much rather hear a story with depth than the headline. And so finding that balance in a world where your editors don't exist, but where they do exist, they're putting, they've always put a ton of pressure on you guys to get a story out and in to print tonight at, what time did you have to get in? <laughs> I'm sure you know. When you first started working for the newspaper, what time did you have to have your story in? Oh yeah, like 10:45, but sometimes earlier. Yeah, and it didn't, and it would not run otherwise, right? And now we're just in it. So I think the technology is there, I think the resources are there in a disrupted format. But Apple now is going to do a lot of important stories. Google is going to do a lot of important stories. ABC will continue to do a lot of important stories. Kevin's going to continue to do a lot of important stories. ASBN. So stories are all over the place. I think consumers need to figure out how to find it. But I think taking the time and telling the stories, and we're very much strategically thinking about this as the Ravens. We have the Sun and now the Baltimore Banner to a lesser extent, Kevin invites me down, he doesn't come to practice to cover us. Um, but uh, there's a lot of pressure on the post. They used to send two or three people, beat writers, to the Ravens when we first got there in the mid-90s. No one shows up anymore, right? And so finding out what those stories are going to be is really hard for us. How do we tell the story about Todd Monk and our new offensive coordinator? How do we tell the story about Ronnie Stanley and his love of dogs and the attachments that fans will have to our players, to our coaches? By telling those stories, it's really hard for, for an outlet like an ESPN to do. In fact, they're just not doing it. Even the Sun's not doing it anymore. Um, regularly. So I think we want to try to figure out how to meet our readers, our fans, our content consumers where they are. And it's a big challenge. I mean, it is a big challenge for us. Again, we're 250. We're not a media outlet. I mean, I say that we actually have turned ourselves into a media outlet because of the, the lack of coverage. But that's the challenge right now for your generation, which is with all this disruption in platforms and technology and the pressures and the traditional media kind of landscape having changed so much and shifted, how do you get n news, quality news out and sift through all the misinformation and the Instagram and the Snapchat and everything else that's, you know, pulling eyeballs away? Um, because, you know, you used to be able to say, as I said, you're either going to read the paper or watch the news. but. If you weren't a consumer, those were your only two options. Now you have 20 different things you can pull up to read. And I literally do pull up in the morning eight or nine different apps. I'll read AP, I read Baltimore Banner, I read the Baltimore Sun, I read the Washington Post. And it's fatiguing. It's fatiguing. So I think a big challenge. So this just raises a question in my mind. So how, how do you use BaltimoreRavens.com and the reporters that you've hired there? Do you use them to promote the product or do you use them to allow them to be journalists and cover sensitive stories as well as game stories with the, with the Baltimore Ravens? Uh, yeah, we, we are uh, something just shy of a propaganda machine, I would say. So, you know, if we, if we make a mistake, we're not going to kill Tyler Huntley for fumbling the ball on the one-yard line in Cincinnati the way some folks might. <laughs> um, and listen, he made the play, and Tyler cried in the locker room for about 20 minutes, right, and we all sat with him. Um, but we're not going to tell that story on .com because the trust that you have to have for just journalists erodes immediately, right? So 
we're supposed to be, it's just a weird dynamic. And I have this have had this conversation in the last couple of months with our content team, which is how do they maintain integrity and credibility and at the same time report honestly? And it all boils down, life almost boils down in terms of interpersonal to trust. And I think part of it is communicating with our football team to understand what we need to do from a content standpoint. Uh, so Harbaugh and DaCosta understand if we write something that feels a little critical, you can come down the hallway and have that discussion rather than write off our content team for the rest of the, for the, rest of the season, which has happened in some shops that I've been in. Um, and so it's finding that right balance. Um, but it's not really different than what you all do. The associations are different, right? We have more sensitivity to the subject of our content, but we very much are in the same balance that you guys will have to strike as you develop sources, as you write, as you go in and try to get the trust so that you can be in the room and witness the content that you want to write about. Here and in there. Uh, hi, my name's Laura. And I got you. Oh, sorry, did you? No, no, you, okay. yeah. I did. Uh, well, not originally, but uh, yes, at, at one of my stops was at the Browns. So um, since you transitioned from like uh, football team to football team to football team, what's like that transition like? Is it very like cutthroat and like how is it like working for like a different of team sort of? Well, I was recruited to hire, to, to work for every team that I've been hired by. And so no, has not been um, cutthroat for me, I think, going in and it's a, it's a unique um, team of people that you work with. You're very small. You're in a hyper-competitive and hyper-public environment. So if you're doing it right, it becomes a very tight-knit group. I think our organization, along with at the Ravens, not the Browns, big distinction, um, but relative to the St. Louis Cardinals, San Antonio Spurs, I don't think there's any organization that's kind of outpunched its weight and shown kind of integrity and character. And we've been through some stuff, like we had Ray Rice you know, at the Ravens. Doesn't mean we were perfect on everything or that we haven't faced that adversity you talked about in terms of getting through this piece with Lamar, but people have stuck together and that starts with our ownership, Steve Bashotti, who is a huge booster here at the uh, Terps basketball program and you'll see him courtside next time you guys beat Purdue. Um, <laughs> The, uh, but, but he has instilled this sense and I think a maturity about how you run these things. So remember like these billionaire owners, they've been successful at everything. So you can imagine, and I just about this, but like one in 15 and now we're 0 and 8 and you're telling me it's working. You know, that, that is very foreign to them in terms of their, it's foreign to most human beings, but it's foreign to them, especially um, in their professional careers. And so it's hard to work through the public nature. Even if you run a public company, you have four earnings calls a year. If you are a football team, you have 17 successive earnings calls. Every Monday, Stephen A., Kevin, and all these guys are going to be on telling you what you did right, what you did wrong. They love you or they don't. You should run. You should, you should um, run away. So um, that part of it really pushes us together. And it's, a, it's special in the building. It really is. Um, realizing that you don't have control over the player, I think, is the first thing. So you better figure out who the players are that you have in your locker room. And I think a lot of it comes down to, again, communication when you hit something that was unexpected and negative. I think um, depending on who your counterpart is, it because you don't control them, you just have to be nimble and agile. And at the end of the day, you have to be, and this is where I think Steve and Ozzy and Harbaugh and Brian Billick before have been so good at the Ravens is they just stick together and stick to their values. And you all will be challenged with this, trust me, as journalists. Um, throughout your careers, that kind of value set that you all are being taught here and that you'll establish and 
um, you know, for yourselves as young professionals, um, you know, keep thinking about that. And I think it's really important to adhere to that. We just spent two days at an offsite down um, with my senior staff on the business side, and we went right back through the values. Like, this is what we stand for, character, teamwork, excellence, resilience, growth mindset. You know, those are our five. Um, so when you hit those moments, when Kyrie says something that you don't want him to say, you know, I think communicating with him and reaching out is really important, the relationships you have with a player. But secondarily, there are some times when a player's values, Ray Rice for the Ravens, for instance, historically, just don't fit and you have to, you have to, you have a decision to make. Different organizations make that decision differently. And someone right now in the NBA would love to trade for Kyrie Irving, make no mistake. But every organization won't do that. And I'm not passing judgment right or wrong, because actually I know Joe Sy and Ali Weisberg, who own the Nets, um, and I count them as friends. Um, but they had to come to, I think, be forced to a decision after their values were challenged over the course of really like a year and a half with Kyrie, because so, he started in COVID, um, deciding he wasn't going to get the booster um, or the um, um, the shot originally the vaccine to play, which he he had good company. There were a lot of a lot of players that decided not to. Um, so I, I think values based decision making is really important in leadership. So let me go over here and then I'll come back over here. Yep. Sounds like you got to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> One of my former students. <laughs> um, I would say it's a factor. Our mission is to win football games, serve our fans, and positively impact the community. So nowhere in there does it drive a brand or a profit. Uh, He's won 45 games. <laughs> yeah, he has. He has. And so for us, we think if the football is excellent, the rest takes care of itself. So if the right decision for us from a football standpoint is to keep Lamar or not keep Lamar, then we'll all stand by that. And we'll be ready. Um, the Ravens were here before any single player, before Sashi Brown, before uh, Steve Bashotti, and they'll be here long after. I think you know what we build persists through time. And it's important in those moments because for every time that you think you're going to sign a player and you're going to do great, think about where the Brooklyn Nets were when they got Kyrie and Kevin Durant. Like, think about what was written about what was happening at that time if they could get Kyrie there, James Harden. How's that worked out, right? So I think one of the traps in sports is that you assume past performance is going to be future performance. And the reality is any elite performance in any league is very fleeting. So what LeBron has done is unbelievable. But you just can't bet on that necessarily. We would have LeBron play quarterback if we could right now. But, um, but I do think it's one of the things that's, that's, that, that can be a trap. Now, we love Lamar, and we want Lamar to be a Raven for a long period of time. He's got a ton of people in his ear right now that are telling him to – hold, wait, what have you. And, you know, I think it'd be an easy thing to go out and say, okay, let's sign him to a guaranteed contract, 50, $55 million a year. I'm not even sure what the top quarterback contract is right now. I think it's 51, Aaron Rodgers. But Russell Wilson just signed a much lesser deal a year ago, and Denver was on high, right? Um, and that hasn't worked out so well. So every decision has risk inherent with it. There's no guarantees in this business. And I think we understand that. So when we make a decision, we've made the best decision we can at the time. It may work out, it may not. Um, Lamar may bring us to a Super Bowl or an AFC championship. He may not. We're going to love him the same either way as long as he does what we ask him to do, which is come in, be a pro, give his all on the field. 
and that's all we're all doing in life and certainly in, in at the Ravens in our business. But we do factor in, uh, certainly planning on the business side, we factor in kind of the team's performance. We've been in the playoffs 17 of the last 20 years. Um, so our our business is 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 rolling, um, and and that's the expectations. In fact, we have the fatigue. People are like you made the playoffs, big deal. We need you to win the Super Bowl. Um, that's how good our team's performance has been. And so you know, when I look at Lamar, I see a really dynamic, young, fun-loving, good-hearted, um, you know, young man that's got a huge decision and a really climactic point in his the business part of his football career right in front of him. You know, we hope that he'll be with us. Okay, one more, right here. So I don't get too involved on the football stuff until it reaches this kind of level with, with Lamar. But um, we, we very much are, we just signed a lease. We're working on a naming rights uh, deal for the extension period of our lease. We've got $500 million, $600 million from the state. We've got to figure out how to renovate our stadium, which is 20 years old. So to your point, um, there really is no offseason. Having said that, with friends in baseball who have 160 dates, friends in basketball and hockey who have 80 dates, having 10 to 20 gives you a lot more time just to, to work strategically. So, you know, our people planning, you know, the things that, that you just ought to do as good business practices, we spend a lot of time in the off season and most of our sponsorship deals get cut during this time. So we spend a lot of time with our partners and sponsors. And then, you know, we'll, we'll look very hard at the gun violence in Baltimore and are there ways that we can positively impact that from a community standpoint. We just build, uh, invested $20 million through Mr. Bashadi and the Ravens to build a community center in Northwest Baltimore. So all those are really important projects to us. Again, one of the three pillars of our mission. And that's nonstop, that's 365 for us. We, we do try to take a break. Um, June, mid-June to mid-July, that's when the NFL really shuts down. Otherwise, we're rolling. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. This is great. great.